Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Ewart. It's Monday, May 23rd. This is Africa 54. Tigrayans fleeing hunger are so hopeless, some are abandoning their families. The 194-member World Health Organization convenes in person to discuss global issues. And we'll have the latest exciting Basketball Africa League highlights. Nigerian police have discovered the severed head of a state legislator who went missing last week in an Ambra state where the government accuses separatists of carrying out a spate of killings and kidnappings. Okechuku Okoye, a legislator in the Anambra State Assembly, and his aide went missing on May 15th. His head was found Saturday night in a park in the Newi South government area, according to Anambra State Police. The Anambra State Governor has put up a $24,000 reward for information on the killer or killers. For months, only a trick of aid has entered Ethiopia's Tigray region, parts of which the United Nations says are likely in a state of famine. Some Tigrayans fleeing hunger are so hopeless, they are abandoning their families. Henry Wilkins reports from Sekota. Tigray has been under a de facto humanitarian blockade for a year, with the Ethiopian government and Tigrayan rebels, TPLF, blaming each other for preventing aid from getting through. Journalists are banned from entering the region, but recently VOA travelled to the town of Sokota, just 10 kilometres away from Tigray. Here, thousands of people displaced from Tigray by war and hunger congregate each morning outside aid points, set up by the UN and non-profits. Some days they receive food, mostly they do not. Many live in hastily erected metal shelters like Kasahun Baye, a father of six who arrived in Sokota from Tigray recently. This small bag of personal items is all he has. He left everything behind, including his family. I know my family has nothing to eat, but I can't do anything. I will try to bring them here if they survive until I can go back. I'm not cruel. It's because the situation is beyond anything I am able to deal with. Aid agencies say displaced persons staying in vast tents on the outskirts of Sokota are in a state of emergency for lack of food. In Tigray, they say some 700,000 people are living under famine-like conditions. At least 1,900 children have already died of starvation, say regional officials. But the full extent of the humanitarian disaster is not known due to an information blackout. Many are unable even to escape Tigray. Kasa Tagaru belongs to the Amhara ethnic group. She says her ethnic Tigrayan husband did not come with her and her children because he feared being killed due to his ethnicity by soldiers, either crossing the civil war's front line or when he arrived in Amhara. Is he alive or dead from starvation or something else? My nine-year-old daughter is always asking about him. Militia groups as well as military personnel are everywhere in Sokota, a buffer to Tigrayan forces just beyond the horizon. Rights groups have been ringing the alarm bells about ethnic-based violence and killings against Tigrayans by militias and security forces, including in the Amhara region. Establishing humanitarian corridors to allow people to escape Tigray would help alleviate the crisis, say advocacy groups. Absolutely, there need to be more ways for civilians who are trying to flee to get out. I mean, that is a basic principle in international law. That's a very basic kind of, you know, refugee 101 um, issue. Zenash Waku is an aid worker in Sokota. We are accepting displaced people that arrive here, even though they are from Tigray. That is part of being human. I believe people shouldn't suffer because of disagreement among politicians. Meanwhile, 
desperation continues to drive people to make the treacherous journey to Sokota across these rugged hills. The journey takes four days and nights without any food or water. Anyway, what have I got to lose? I would rather die trying to get out than stay here and die of hunger. Most people who spoke to VOA said before leaving to cry, they witnessed adults and children dying of starvation. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Sokota, Ethiopia. Authorities in Ethiopia's northern Amhara region have arrested four employees of a U.S.-based online media outlet, while the whereabouts of two others are unclear. Nisia International Broadcasting confirms three employees were arrested on Thursday and a fourth was arrested on Friday. They were reportedly arrested over their reporting on the activity of a local volunteer militia known as PANO. A spokesperson for the Amhara Regional Administration and government has not yet responded to media requests for comment, according to Reuters. A government official says hundreds of people have been evacuated to safety after heavy rains hammered South Africa's coastal province of KwaZulu-Natal, flooding roads and damaging property. The province is still restoring damaged infrastructure and making plans to return people to their homes after flooding last month killed 448. More than 6,800 were left homeless. Officials say April's flooding caused more than $1.58 billion of infrastructure damage. The World Health Organization held its annual health assembly over the weekend, marking the first time the WHO has convened its 194 member states for an in-person gathering since COVID-19 surfaced in late 2019. Paul Ndiho has more. Disease, destruction and the Ukraine war loomed last Sunday as WHO members discussed a still raging COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Tedros Gavriyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, warned of the COVID implications still facing the world. Is it over? No, it's most certainly not over. I know that's not the message you want to hear. Reported cases are declining significantly from the peak of the Omicron wave in January and reported deaths are at their lowest since March 2020. In many countries, most restrictions have been lifted and life appears to look like it did before the pandemic. However, Gabriesus issued vital words of caution on COVID-19. Reported cases are increasing in almost 70 countries in all regions. And this is in a world in which testing rates have plummeted and reported deaths are rising in my continent, the continent with the lowest vaccination coverage. As the United Nations seeks to define its future role in global health policy, the WHO's plan is the most ambitious in its 75-year history. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta praised Gabriesus for his leadership during the coronavirus pandemic. I commend the Director General Dr. Tedros for his exemplary leadership and commitment during one of the most challenging periods ever experienced by WHO. This would not have been possible without the consistent commitment and exceptional expertise and indeed the sacrifice demonstrated by the entire Secretariat. Uhuru Kenyatta, whose country, Kenya, is on the executive board, spoke at the Geneva Health Assembly saying the pandemic exposed the overdependence of developing countries to external markets. No country is immune and no country, however well, however well resourced, can do this alone. We must therefore foster greater cooperation and collaboration to find lasting solutions to the challenges facing our generation. Dr. Tedros Gavriesus' first term was turbulent. He is expected to be reappointed to a second five-year term. 
He helped us steer the global response to the pandemic and grappled with a sexual abuse scandal involving WHO staff in the Democratic Republic of Congo. While he faced his share of criticism, Gabriel Jesus has also received broad backing and is running unopposed, guaranteeing him a second term. New health challenges are already looming including hepatitis of a mysterious origin that has made children in many countries ill and growing numbers of monkeypox cases far from Central and West Africa, where the disease is typically concentrated. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Elsewhere, several African presidents are joining the world's political and business elite in Davos, Switzerland, for the World Economic Forum's annual meeting that started Monday and runs through Thursday. It's the WEF's first in-person meeting since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. African leaders in attendance include Malawian President Lazarus Chakwera, Zimbabwean President Emerson Manangagwa, Namibian President Hage Geingob, and Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Senegalese President Macky Sall says he will visit Moscow and Kiev in the coming weeks in his capacity as chairman of the African Union. He says he wants to see a de-escalation in Ukraine and peace through dialogue between the two sides. Sall says he received a mandate from the African Union to undertake the trip for which Russia had extended an invitation. Speaking at a joint news conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Saul stated Africa's position on the Russia-Ukraine war. It is a conflict which is not regional. It's in another continent. Of course it affects us. As Africans, we want peace. We don't want to be aligned with this conflict. Even if we condemn the invasion, we are working for the de-escalation. We are calling for a ceasefire, for there to be a dialogue. In any case, we will end up sitting around a table. So that is the African position. It is not to say that we are for or against this one or that one. And that's our position. That was Maki Sal, chairman of the African Union speaking. Indigenous groups in South Africa say they remain concerned that a controversial development project to build Amazon's African headquarters on land that they hold sacred could still go ahead, despite a court ruling that has suspended construction. Clara Frank has more. Groups representing the descendants of South Africa's earliest inhabitants, the Khoi and San, filed a successful court motion in March to halt the construction of the 70,000 square meter river club development in Cape Town, where Amazon is slated to be the main tenant. The judge in the case says that the development's economic and infrastructural benefits should never override the fundamental rights of indigenous groups. However, some indigenous leaders who lead regular rituals at the site to honor their ancestors, say the damage has already been done to their sacred land. And they say they will pursue legal action until all traces of the development are removed. Although the construction has been stopped, the amount of devastation on the floodplain and the fact that the old Lisbeth Channel has been destroyed is something that is quite deeply painful. Um, they, in our opinion, you know, these are heritage crimes, and, uh, and so we will continue um, in our pursuit in the High Court to, to have this entire building undone. Feelings run deep for indigenous groups who oppose the development and the site at the confluence of the Black River and the Lisbeck. Both Khoi and San people say it will also block their view to the equally sacred Lion's Head Mountain above Cape Town. We are connected to this earth to this soil, to this, to this river, by the dust of our ancestors and our umbilical cords. For thousands of years, our people have been living here. This water contains our memory of our people. So we are deeply connected to this, to this very special piece of land here. It's this place where we come and do our sacred rituals. The companies behind the River Club development say they are deeply disappointed with the judge's ruling and the jobs that would have been created would help ease South African high levels of unemployment, where about one-third of working-age adults are jobless.
Leesbeck Leisure Properties Trust and its partners are reviewing the judge's decision to stop construction. And they plan to take the legal battle to South Africa's Supreme Court of Appeal. Clara Frank, VOA News. Nigerian startups mostly in the financial technology sector attracted nearly 25% of the $5.2 billion invested in African startup companies in 2021, according to the African Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. Timothy Obiezu has more. In February, the Nigerian technology startup Crowdforce announced a big break. It had received $3.6 million from investors to expand its financial services operations to many more underserved communities. And we were looking to scale faster and really um, gain market share. And what we were doing was also very impact related because what we're doing is we're creating jobs, right? We're creating avenues for people to make extra income in their communities. Crowdforce was initially launched as a data collection company seven years ago, but the company completely overhauled its business model when it realized it could feel a need for bank accounts. Because when we collected data on 4.5 billion traders, what we saw was a lot of them didn't have bank accounts. And then the ones that had bank accounts had a very tough time accessing the cash that was sent to them. That's where we kind of realized, look, there's a bigger problem to solve here. Around 60% of Africa's 1.2 billion people lack access to banks or financial services, say experts. It's a big problem that technology startups in Africa are trying to fix says the African Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, or AVCA. In a recent report, the industry group said African startups attracted $5.2 billion from venture capital last year, and that West Africa, led by Nigeria, accounted for the largest share of investments. AVCA says investors are looking to cash in on Africa's huge population of young people. Africa has um, the, the most youthful population um, in the world. And as, as such, as the proportion of skilled labor increases, then we expect to see a surge in human capital. AVC says increased internet penetration in Africa and more favorable government policies are also contributing to increased investments in financial technology services or fintech. But there are obstacles to overcome, such as weak currencies and policies, say some experts. It's still made up of virgin markets. The standard of living is quite low, and our regulations haven't been consistent in recent times. Yet, with new talent emerging in technology, more startups with big goals are emerging in Nigeria and elsewhere in Africa. Tim Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Let us know what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs in our website at voaafrica.com. Be sure to join Africa 54 on Tuesday for Lino Mudu's weekly health report. Still to come, we'll have basketball African League highlights from Rwanda. But first, here's Heidi Adams to tell us about Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On the next Straight Talk Africa, my conversation with Nobel Peace Prize laureate Dr. Dennis Bukwege. He'll talk about his new book, his work helping women caught in armed conflict, and his global campaign to end rape as a weapon of war. We'll also look at the impact of the abortion debate in the United States on countries in Africa and other parts of the world. We'll discuss why terminating pregnancies is not permitted for any reason in 10 out of 54 countries in Africa. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. The quarter-final games of the Basketball Africa League season two playoffs tipped off at the Kigali Arena over the weekend. VOS Jackson Bungani has the highlights. Morocco was still in need during the second quarter with a big play as La Ricci passes to El Masbahi, who got the ball to Drame for a nice dunk, tying the score at 23. 
But with five minutes left in the half, Petros Goncalves hits a three-pointer, pushing their lead to 10. Down by 26, Morocco's Von Stoglin finds Haruna, who makes a three to get his team some points, with less than nine minutes left in the game. It doesn't look good for Sally as La Ricci loses the ball to Petros Moraes, who scores two, extending the team lead to 17 with three minutes to go. Petro wins it with a final score of 102 89. And then there was Cameroon's Fab, who beat host Rwanda's Reg by just three points. Down by four in the third, Rwanda's Fila tries to make a pass but loses the ball to Cameroon's Moman, who finds Bias for a nice dunk. This time Moman tries a shot himself and makes a three, pushing Fab's lead to 11. But Reg manages to narrow the lead in the fourth quarter, down by only four, when Chovozwa passes to Shaka, who makes a three, and the crowd goes wild. Big shot! The Shaka attack has happened! Less than 10 seconds to go, and Rwanda's DZ passes to Thomas Jr., who tries to tie the game with a three but misses. And that is the end of the second quarter final. Cameroon beats the host team 66 63. On Sunday, Tunisia's U.S. Monastil first off with South Africa's Cape Town Tigers in the first game. Tunisia dominated South Africa 107-67. And later that day, Baal's reigning champs, Egypt's Zamalek, defeated Guinea's Seydou Legacy Athletic Club, Slack, 66-49. With less than three minutes until the halftime and up by seven, Monastil's De Abate passes to Gayaza, who passes to Liani for an exciting dunk. He does it in a big way. Tunisia continues to lead in the third quarter as Coles Jr. finds Layani who gets the ball to Dixon for a big three. Five minutes left in the game and Cape Town continues to struggle being down by 21. Ganapamo passes to Kabongo but he loses the ball and Tunisia Slimane dunks on the other end of the court. With a few seconds to go, Monastil Zabasi passes to Jaziri who hits a three in the last seconds of the game, winning the game by 40 points. Another domination took place on Sunday when Egypt's Zamalek beat Guinea Slack by 17 points. It was close to the half when Zamalek Strawberry Jr. stole the ball and scored a big three, extending their lead to 15. He goes for a big three! Guinness Miller Jr. comes down with two points to cut Zamalek's lead to 10. But Zamalek continues to dominate in the fourth quarter when Sosa finds Mahmoud for a 100 dunk. The statement dunk there, big hand. Under four minutes left in the game and Strawberry passes to Kejo who hits a three as Egypt stays well on top and ending the game with a final score of 66 to 49. Four teams will now advance to the semi-finals which take place at the Kigali Arena on May 25th. For more insight on the Basketball African League action, VOA Sports reporter Sonny Young is standing by live in Kigali, Rwanda. Hello, Sonny. Bring us up to speed on the atmosphere when the BAL quarterfinals kicked off on, uh, on the weekend. Sporty greetings from Kigali, Esther. I'm standing in front of the Kigali Convention Center, one of the big landmarks in Rwanda's capital. The Kigali Arena has been the big landmark for the Basketball Africa League Finals. And over the weekend, Esther, I thought it was a great atmosphere inside the arena. In terms of noise, probably uh, the loudest game of the weekend was the one between Rwanda Energy Group and FAP. The Rwandan fans were blowing trumpets, banging drums, while the supporters for FAP were waving their Cameroonian flags. Unfortunately, the Rwandan uh, fans left the arena disappointed. Uh, they lost the game by three points. But overall, Esther, I thought it was a really, really nice atmosphere at the Kigali Arena. So you say they lost and so there is a lot of disappointment. Uh, will that hurt the attendance at the arena for the remaining games? Well, Esther, I think it will hurt attendance. Uh, just as an example, on Sunday, uh, both crowds were much less than what we saw 
at the uh, Reg FAP game. So I think some of the local fans here in Kigali will probably stay away uh, for the remaining games. But I know ball organizers are hoping to uh, entice them and, you know, maybe they'll hand out some free tickets, uh, which I think would would not be a bad move at this point to bring more fans into the arena. But I think it will have an impact, Esther, on attendance uh, during the rest of the tournament. So how are the Wednesday games shaping up so far? Well, I think, Esther, they're going to be two closely contested semifinals. In the uh, first semifinal, FAP will play uh, Petro de Luanda uh, from Angola, and that will be followed by uh, probably the best semifinal. Uh, that'll be a rematch of the 2021 final between U.S. Monastir from Tunisia and Zamalek from Egypt. Now, Zamalek, uh, Esther, has not lost a game during two ball seasons. They have won 12 consecutive games. On the revenge factor, though, Monastir really hoping to topple Zamalek and bring the trophy home to Tunisia. We'll be watching, Sunny. Thank you so much for your reporting. VOA Sunny Young reporting live for us from Kigali, Rwanda. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.